My name is Mark Siegler, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, I welcome you to our lecture today in the series on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Uh, today's talk uh, is the third talk this quarter that is co-sponsored uh, with the Institute of Politics. Uh, I have been very pleased with this new collaboration between the IOP and the McLean Center. Uh, Darren Reesberg, the Executive Director of the Institute of Politics, is with us today. Darren, welcome. Um, today's talk, the, the last talk in the autumn quarter, will be the 10th this year in a series of 28 Wednesday noon lectures on health reform. Uh, we plan to resume the health reform lectures after the holidays on Wednesday, January 8, when Albert Wang, uh, Albert, are you in the audience? Uh, yes, Albert is here. Um, uh, another talk co-sponsored with the IOP will speak on the impact of health reform on the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, now I am delighted to introduce to you today's speaker, Professor Austin Goolsby. Professor Goolsby received his PhD from MIT in economics. He's currently the Robert, T. Gwyn, Robert P. Gwynn Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Professor Goolsby is also a research associate for the National Bureau of Economic Research and an economics consultant for ABC News. Professor Goolsby contributes regularly to the Wall Street Journal, Slate, the New York Times. In fact, some of you may have seen this past Monday his article on the benefits of pre-kindergarten education, um, an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal. Quoting from that particular piece, uh, Professor Goolsby said, quote, there is one area where we ought to all agree, early childhood education. Investments in pre-kindergarten education have among the highest payoffs of any government policy, and whatever budget agreement emerges should restore the country's long-standing commitment to early education. We'll see if he has the same things to say about health care. <laughs> Uh, from, from 2010 to 2011, Professor Goolsby served as chairman of President Obama's um, Council of Economic Advisors. Earlier, as chief economist and staff director of the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, Professor Goolsby helped to guide the Obama administration's response to the economic crisis. Professor Goolsby has been named one of the gurus of the future by the Financial Times and one of the 40 under 40 by Crane's Business Chicago. But perhaps most important, I learned last evening from one of Professor Goolsby's classmates uh, at Yale that, that Austin was known as one of the great improv comedians. I didn't know that before. Today, Professor Goolsby will be speaking on health care and the economy Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you for having me. Okay, I hope, uh, I hope you're not disappointed in the sense that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a health economist, and I, uh, I only agreed to do this because Dr. Chin, while giving me some other medical procedures, said we really you know, would like to... <laughs> get a speaker and I said he, he and I he's been my doctor we since we both got to the university some many years ago uh, and I agreed to do it now I didn't know that the health plan was going to have rolled out and we would have whatever complications we've had a year ago when I agreed to uh, to to do the talk but that's fine uh, I thought what I'd do is walk through a little bit um, how do economists, and particularly economists that are, are not specialized in healthcare, how do they think about the role of healthcare in the economy, the various options that we entertain for, for health reform, and what has come out of the what, what's come out of the Affordable Care Act, and what should we look forward to or 
what should we anticipate, maybe look forward to is the wrong phrase, uh, going into the future. Now there's a joke, a bad joke, but a recurrent joke in the economics profession. Every winter we have our job market. We do the interviews at the AEA meetings uh, in the, at the beginning of January. And then for January, February, the people come in and they give their papers. There's always at least one health economist in, on the job market. And some bozo on our faculty always says, well, you know, uh, with 20 years from now, every job candidate's going to be in health economics because the entire economy is going to be health. And they say the same, and it's always some junior faculty, the new guy, he tells us a joke. Yeah, ha ha, that's what we've been saying that for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and so I would say the first characterization that most economists have, not knowing that much detail about the, um, about the medical system directly, except as patients, is that to them it's all about the money and it's all about the cost. So I'm gonna, I want to think through some of the budgetary, uh, federal government and individual and business level budgetary implications of the health system. But that's kind of the place where, where their head comes from. The basic fact of the U.S. economy is that from 1960, when health was a less than 5% of GDP, to today, where it's something like 18% of GDP, there's never really been the rise of any sector of the economy at that kind of speed with that kind of persistence. Even the much maligned and characterized rise of financial services as a share of GDP uh, was not as big as that. So that's led to a major discussion within health economics between two camps which are basically about, well, is that good money or is that bad money? Is it a terrible sign that we are spending that much of our economy on health care? And should we be trying to drive it down? Or is that the best money we ever could have spent? And so the types of evidence that the two camps use, one camp says, compare the U.S. to anybody else. We're way more expensive. We get less bang for the buck than any other country. And the other camp says, compare objectively what we get for what we pay for, and it looks like it's worth it. So the economists go study various kinds of cardiological care and innovations, and they back out what's the implied extra longevity cost. And the answer is it costs something like sixty to $70,000 for an extra year of life. And they say, well, what a bargain. What, for $60,000 to be able to live an extra year, there's nothing. That's the best deal that you could possibly get. So that's the backdrop of, of what, how the economists argue about the role of health care in the economy. And then they start, depending which of those camps you're from, that brings you into the debates about, well, what health care reforms should we have? Did we have what will be the impact of those health care reforms? There's one group of economists, and, and I know there, there are people who have debated it also in this room, who say, well, why don't we just move to a single-payer system? That if we move to single-payer, um, it would be better for health terms, it would cost less money, etc. And I think the tension with the single-payer option, or call it socialized medicine option, however you want to think about it, is that does two things at once. One is it covers everybody, and you essentially get free care. The other is uh, it affects the cost side of how much does it cost to actually provide it. I apologize if I look funny. I've got Those are tasty sandwiches, but they're coated in flour, and so now I've got flour all over me. To cover people, depending on what you think of the evidence of how people respond to having free care, costs something like 150 to 200 billion dollars a year of medical, uh, additional medical cost. 
And so the question is, how do you pay for that? And the advocates of single payer say, well, but if you compare to countries where they have single payer, costs are so much less that if we could have the cost structure that they have, it would pay for the 150 to 200 billion dollars. The complications, as you might imagine, include we don't really know why are the costs lower. So we do know that there's at least 15 percent administrative costs and profits for those that are for profits that come about on the insurance side and some of the uh, provision of medical care. So presumably you get rid of that. But our doctors are also paid substantially more than doctors in other countries. And if you take measures of, I've seen measures of what were people's SAT scores of doctors in the relative ranking equivalent, okay, or IQ or whatever. Doctors tend to be, and I'm not just buttering you up, they tend to be very high test scoring, very high IQ, high intelligence. It's a, a occupation that has a very high status in both income and quality of the inputs. So in other, as compared to other countries. So if you look at other countries, it is not the case that doctors are as highly paid relative to the average person, nor is it the case that they tend to be as high in the, in the class ranking uh, as they are in the United States. So if you were going to move to single payer, you got to come to some decision about that. Are doctors going to be paid less? Do you care if you're getting a different type of student becoming a doctor? Medical Medication costs are much higher in the United States than in other countries. And you got to come to a decision, okay, do you think that if the U.S. went to single payer, would we be able to impose very strict price controls on pharmaceuticals the way they do in other countries, or are those countries largely free riding off of the R&D that's taking place on medicines in the U.S.? Because if you got a lot less medicine, that'd be problematic over the longer term. They definitely have different uh, legal environments as relate to lawsuits against medical professionals. My understanding from David Cutler, who's a leading uh, health economist, is that in, if you compare Canada, the, the visit to emergency room in Canada, guy says, ah, I have a pain in my chest, I feel terrible. The probability that that person would receive two aspirin and be told, come back in the morning if your chest still hurts, is way dramatically higher in Canada than in the U.S. The outcomes health-wise are not obviously different for people coming in with, with, uh, with the same description of symptoms, which might lead you to say, whoa, if we, if we move to uh, doing angiogram, doing bypass, doing whatever we do, maybe we have a lot of excessive procedures. But if you mention these facts to doctors, a lot of them will say, what do you think would be the outcome if a guy came in and said, I'm, oh, I'm dying, my chest is killing me, if I gave him an aspirin and he happened to die of a heart attack overnight? They'd say, the guy came in, he told you it was his chest was hurting and you sent him home with an aspirin. So for a number of, uh, for a number of reasons, I think there's still an open question. If you're in the camp that say, hey, why, did, why don't we just go ahead and have a government-run healthcare system the way they do in other countries. For that to work, you have to also get the cost levels down in the United States. And there are a variety of reasons, as, as I outlined, and you could probably think of others, that we don't really know if you would be able to get the cost levels down in the United States in a way that would pay for that. But it does raise what, for the economists, is the most important economic consideration about the healthcare system, which is the unbelievable rising cost of healthcare over time. That's contributed a great deal to that rise as a share of GDP. It's not just that we've gotten older and so we consume more, it's that the cost of every, every single thing has, has 
risen from 1965 to 2010, four and a half percentage points per year, which if not into the compounding business, with compounding, that adds up to a big, big, big increase. Two or three times the rate of inflation over that period. And boy, if you continue at that rate, it's like uh, college tuition or other things. You know, the, you, you start making extrapolations and you get to very big numbers. Now, this, uh, so, so health care cost inflation is the key factor as applies to the economy and as applies to the government budget, as I'll outline in a second. But it's worth emphasizing what a bizarro world the economy of the health care sector is compared with any others because we've got this bizarro world of cream skimming in the system that we have designed. That is, the central fact of health insurance is that people know about their conditions and insurers don't. And so it creates a cat and mouse game in which they're trying to shut out the guys who are the sickest and the people who know they have problems are trying to squeeze in through somewhere and the economic theory tells you where you've got that kind of asymmetric information problem and where you allow cream skimming, you're going to have massive market failure. You're going to have a whole bunch of people that on average, they would, we would determine what the prices of health care would be and everybody would subscribe. But because we have no way to have a veil of ignorance, you're going to have wide parts of the market that do not function, in which they say, we just won't serve people who have pre-existing conditions. We don't want people who come in, you know, like the old Chicago thing, we don't want anybody that nobody sent here. We don't want to insure anybody that doesn't have an employer group or that's not part of some bigger thing because we don't have any idea what the real probabilities are that you have a very expensive condition. That bizarro and unpleasant world has characterized our system for 40, 50 years. Uh, and when spliced onto the rise of health care, the, the, the health care cost inflation rate, uh, I think you can see why, why there were a lot of people who felt like we had to do something to try to address that. We have seen a miraculous, I don't think is an exaggeration, miraculous decrease in the health care cost inflation rate in the last several years. And now we're trying to figure out, economists as well as the, the entire health care industry, why did that happen and is it going to continue? Now, my dad's thing for all along was, don't stop doing something just because you don't understand it. And likewise with this. Well, look, we're, we're extremely happy that I told you from 1965 to 2010, health care inflation was 4.5% a year. From 2000 to 2007, so the tail end of that, it slowed slightly to a little less than 4%. But from 07 to 10, it was 1.8%. And now from 2010 through 2013, it's been 1.3% a year. Yeah, I just say, okay, whatever, it was 4.5, now it's 1.3. That's a humongous, tremendously giant difference. And over 30 years, that's the difference between the U.S. government going bankrupt and Medicare basically stabilizes as a share of GDP. So this could not be more important. The same guy, David Cutler, that I told you about before, did a study that said, look, if this continues at even half the rate, if the decrease is even half permanent, that implies something like $770 billion of savings to businesses and individuals over the next 10 years, to say nothing about what the government's uh, deficit impact would be. So we're trying to figure out what share of that slowdown of health care costs is just from the business cycle and what share is from something fundamental. The business cycle side, uh, the highest estimates are up to three quarters of it came from just a business cycle. And they look back and they say, hey, when, when times are bad, people spend less on everything. We've had a lot of debt. People are spending less on health care just because they can't afford it. And that's why it looks like inflation slowed down, but it's not really that. It's just people can't afford health care. 
On the other side, they tend to look at the fact that the decreases have been even bigger in Medicare where the people are retired. So what, what sense would the recession have if you're 70 years old to whether you went to the doctor? So they point and say, no, look, there must be something more fundamental going on. And the, some of them, some of that decrease they attribute to the Affordable Care Act. So they'll say, look, the Affordable Care Act dramatically reduces the amount of payments that you'll get for readmission to the hospital, for example, or for uh, infections from a, from a catheter. And those areas where they decrease the payments for pay for mistakes, uh, if you want to think of it that way, you've seen readmission rates to the hospital drop almost 10% in just the last couple of years. And those, um, I apologize if I don't have the medical term, center line infections have dropped 40% in the last four years. So for those, people say, hey, well, maybe that's just people responding to incentives. Maybe this proves hospitals and doctors respond to incentives and individuals are going to respond to incentives. And if we could transform the healthcare cost inflation rate down to something like the rate of consumer price index inflation, we could transform Medicare from a problem that's growing exponentially and destroying us to something that's merely catastrophic, like (laughs) Social Security. That is, we could transform it just to be, in magnitude, the aging of the population. Okay, so if you talk to economists about Social Security, they say, yeah, look, Social Security has has long-term sustainability issues, but it's a totally understandable size and it's totally doable if we sit down and in 20 minutes, if we sit around a table, and I realize it'd be a big table, but if we sat around a table and we said what would work, we could agree on Social Security what would work. You say, okay, we're going to have some be higher taxes, some be lower benefits, whatever, but we have an idea of, of how to do it and, and of what level of pain it would be, that it would be significant but not, not really horrible. Medicare and Medicaid have not had that because if they rise three times the rate of inflation, they have the aging problem of Social Security plus this compounding problem of cost inflation. At the rates of slowdown that we've seen in the last three to five years, that goes away. The projections from the Congressional Budget Office are now that if this continues, even if not fully, if partially this continues, that they could stabilize Medicare as a share of GDP and turn it more into a Social Security size problem than the, than the Medicare size problem that it has been. Which brings us then to the Affordable Care Act, in which there is a, some group of people says, this was all about coverage and not really about cost. I think that's not correct. And I wasn't that central in the design of the Affordable Care Act. But I did observe the following. There are at least seven, maybe six and a half, depends how you want to count one of them. There are at least six and a half different camps who believe what they know what the key to health care cost inflation has been. That's fundamentally what we have to figure out for the Affordable Care Act, for the U.S. government budget, and for our individual and business budget is why are the health care costs been rising so much? Why are they slowing down? How do we keep them slow? One camp says that you can limit the growth of health care costs by increasing out-of-pocket expenses, that the root of the problem is nobody knows what the price of anything is. They've got insurance, they go to the doctor, they don't know what the price, and, and the same price of the same thing is, um, can vary tremendously by whether you're insured or not insured or which hospital you go to, and no, nobody knows what the cost is. So make people pay out-of-pocket, and they will care about costs, and you will see inflation come down. 
A second group says preventive care and chronic disease management are the fundamental keys to slowing the growth of healthcare costs. That if we would check people's blood pressure regularly, they look at very poor countries like Cuba or others where they've, where they've had success with major public health efforts, where they don't have the money to actually provide procedures, so they instead have people calling up, did you take your medicine? Have you checked your blood sugar levels today? You know, whatever, whatever it might be. There's a comparative effectiveness camp, which is a lot of economists uh, working with, with doctors in this camp would say, even controlling for the same person with the same diagnosis and the same conditions, you walk into the hospital in Miami, it costs three times more than if the same type of looking person with the same condition and background goes into the hospital in Minneapolis. There's been a huge effort, as you might imagine, to try to figure out, well, is that because of unobservables of who the patients are, or is it because of they're choosing different procedures? There are some economists who've gone and, and they said, well, you know, compare Boston to San Francisco, uh, there's a 200% higher expenditures in San Francisco on a health-related outcomes, and then they reveal, we're talking about meat consumption. They consume two and a half times more meat per person in San Francisco as in Boston. So obviously that has nothing to do with the, uh, that has nothing to do with the health system. There's just a bunch of unobservable factors uh, across these places. Though some of the latest research here being done by Matt Jenskow, uh, who's here at uh, University of Chicago and others, they find individuals who move. So the guys from, you're from Minneapolis and you move to Miami. Well, it turns out 50%, you bring 50% of your higher costs with you. So at least half of the higher cost is from the patient. But at, but at least half, I, I shouldn't say, if both of them are at least half, then it means they're exactly half. So fine, exactly half you bring with you, but half is coming from, you, you come from Minneapolis, you move to a high cost place, and suddenly your costs jump by 50% of that uh, difference. There's a camp that says we need to introduce information technology the way they say it, we need to move the medical system into the 20th century of technology, not even the 21st, but of medical records of a bunch of these things. They're, in a lot of cases, still paper-based. And they say, if we could start applying productivity growth rates like what's in the IT industry or digital cameras or things that are, that are centered on semiconductors, we could have massive improvements to costs in medical care. There's a group that says, as I told you, incentives to hospitals are, are tremendously important. That as we move to these ACOs, we try to get away from fee-for-service, that'll control inflation. There's a group that says it's about tort reform. And there's a group that says, no, nah, it's not anything. It's not really inflation. They're just better and better care. So that's, uh, that's the key. I should have also added there's a, another group that says it's about market power and we need more command and control and have the government just impose. You can't charge more. You can't have profit rates more than, than X. You can't. You have to spend X percent of, your, um, of the revenues you bring in on, on patient care. Uh, we're going to negotiate harder on pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. Okay, so you got all of these camps. And the second thing I learned is every one of those camps hates every other one of those camps. <laughs> and they spend at least two-thirds of their time bad-mouthing the other one and saying, that is a bunch of baloney and don't listen to what they said. And the two who hate each other the most are the out-of-pocket expense people and the preventive care people. So the preventive care people say the stupidest thing you could ever do is make people pay $200 out of pocket every time they go to get their blood pressure checked. Because if you do that, nobody will get their blood pressure checked and you'll have raging high blood pressure problems and then you'll just have to pay more and more in emergency rooms and in a bunch of you. People have strokes and, and this kind of thing. And the out of pocket people say... Preventive care costs money, doesn't save money. 
They say, because everybody's going to get sick and die anyway, and all you're doing is they were coming in and dying quickly and cheaply, and now you're keeping them alive, and they're going to be really expensive. And I'm like, whoa, wait, did he say that out loud? Like, I don't think they want to say that. But all of these camps, the reason why people say the Affordable Care Act did nothing about cost I think is because each of these camps is saying, well, they didn't do that much about mine, and mine is the only thing that matters. They did a bunch of stupid things for these other ones, and those bozos don't know what they're talking about. Okay, so the, a lot of the doctors say, oh, give me a break, electronic medical records. I don't even like my electronic medical records saying, that's not going to save any money. And uh, so what happened in the Affordable Care Act on cost is the Washington way, which is Washington can solve a problem where the correct answer is everybody gets one-fifth of what they want and we make it a package. Okay, now on the budget, that should make you optimistic because that's basically the right answer. What Washington's not very effective at, what in my view only the private sector's effective at, is I'm giving you seven worldviews. And you have to figure out which one of them's right. And now you have to gear the whole organization around the one that's right. Washington cannot do that. That's what the situation is in healthcare. You got seven different camps of healthcare costs, and we don't really know which one is correct. And we gotta orient the thing around, well, let's figure out what it is and let's do it. I would say the Affordable Care Act set up the equivalent of a series of pilot projects, experiments, little things that if you were committed to go back and figure out from the evidence which ones worked, you could do it. It did some things on preventive care, it did some things on out-of-pocket, did some things on comparative effectiveness, on information technology, a whole bunch of things. And if we were living in an ideal world, what would happen now is we'd say, okay, let's do these for three or four years, now let's go back, let's check the evidence, what worked, and let's gear the whole thing, let's try to promote those. Now, I think you recognize, as well as I do, they aren't going to do that. They being Congress, that's not going to happen. No way. On each of the things, comparative effectiveness, death panels. Okay, whoa, 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 wait, let's back up. We're not going to do that. Let's, let's scale it down. Preventive care. No, you know, but in, in each one they're going to argue and we've gotten into a political dynamic in which we cannot adjust. It's always been the case that when we pass big major bills, we spend the next five years correcting little things. Say, oh, we didn't know that was going to happen. We, you know, we don't hear, oh, we didn't know that would start ringing if we push this button. You know, so we fix up the little glitches, uh, and we're not able to do that now on health care on financial regulatory reform, on a number of major bills, uh, the political environment is one in which they cannot reopen anything. Because if they reopen it, one side said, look, we're going to try to abolish it all, de de defund everything. And the other said, no, 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 if they're going to do that, we're never going to touch it. The doctors will just have to be paid less, or somebody else, you know, medical device tax, whatever it might be, um, you're just going to have to get used to it. The final thought that I will leave you with is, uh, so th th that I, we need to develop the evidence of what has led to the slowdown of health care costs. If it's from what's, uh, even partly, what happened in the ACA, we should do more of that. If it's not, if it's from something else, let's do more of that. Unless it's from having a recession. Let's not do more of that. If that's a, <laughs> let's focus on the seven that I, that I described. But the last thing that I'll say is as regards the um, health plan rollout, the glitches that they've had, and the, the way that this has distracted attention from what's the most important thing if you think about the economics of it. The rollout and the website, and does it work? And my, my belief is they're going to fix that if they haven't fixed it already. I, we got, I got it through the university, so I have no need to go on there. I've wondered whether the fact that there were so many reporters going on there trying to type in their information is what brought down the system to begin with. But th the rollout of the website is not really what we're trying to figure out. What we're trying to figure out is 
Will on these exchanges there be good quality coverage for surprisingly little money? That's what they want to be the case. And part of that, uh, the public perception is, depends on whether they get the young invincibles to sign up. Now, I believe that's a little overstated for the following reason. It is true, I told you, that cream skimming is the fundamental piece of the bizarro world of market failure in, in insurance markets that has characterized the, everything up to when the ACA has passed. And part of that is there are a bunch of healthy people who don't have insurance. But the thing to remember is that most of the young invincibles don't have very much money either. So if they subscribe, they will get substantial tax credits and subsidies from the government to participate. And so the net contribution that they make in monetary terms to the system may not be very high. And if it's not very high, then it actually doesn't matter that much whether they're signing up or not signing up in monetary terms. What matters is uh, whether we're getting the people that were not signing up who have high incomes so that they become net payers into the system. And I don't actually know whether there are that many high income people who were not participating in the system. So that, in a way, makes me optimistic that the system is going to work as long as you keep health care costs growing at a modest rate. Because fundamentally, what's making the thing go is we're applying taxes and we're using the money to provide the subsidies that are getting everybody to participate. And that's whether you get 30%, 50%, or 70% participation from the young invincibles is not going to make that much incremental difference on the cost in the world that I'm uh, describing. So we will see what happens. But basically, my summary is for the economists who are not experts in health care, the whole thing centers around what's happening to the health care cost inflation rate. It's improved dramatically in the last five years. Hopefully, it's for reasons that we understand. And if so, um, we can keep doing those things. Okay, so that's, that's what I had, and we were going to answer some uh, questions if you had.